Well, it was about five years ago that we established something of a new tradition here at Freedom. Uh, the Sunday after Christmas, we would hear the, the background, the story behind uh, some of the favorite Christmas carols and hymns that, uh, that we sing and enjoy every year. And that was, again, going to be the plan for uh, this, uh, this past December the 26th, and so that's going to be the plan uh, for this morning. And so we're going to hear the, the story behind uh, three uh, great uh, Christmas hymns or great Christmas selections of music, after which we'll either sing or listen to that uh, selection. So the first one under consideration is O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, which uh, some of you at least know is technically not a hymn of Christmas but actually a hymn of Advent, uh, but we sing it still throughout the Christmas season as well. O Come, O Come, Emmanuel is probably the oldest Christmas carol still sung today. This popular hymn dates back to the ninth century and represents an important and ancient series of services celebrated by the Catholic Church. It also presents the different biblical roles that, that the Church believed Jesus fulfilled. The universal nature of faith presented in this song can now be best seen by the fact that it is crossed over from a hymn sung in Latin and used in only formal Catholic masses to a carol translated into scores of languages and embraced by every Christian denomination in the world. The writer of O Come, O Come, Emmanuel is unknown. He was no doubt a monk or priest who penned the words before 800 A.D., he was also a scholar with a rich knowledge of both the Old and New Testaments. Once completed, the hymn was evidently picked up by many European churches and monasteries and became an intensely important part of the church. Yet for 51 weeks of each year it was ignored, saved for a single week of Advent Vespers leading up to the celebration of Christ's birth. In its original form, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, was known as a song of the great antiphons, or great O's. The initial Latin text, framed in the original seven different verses, represented the different biblical views of the Messiah. One verse per day was sung or chanted during the last seven days before Christmas. Much more than the very simple, almost monotone melody employed at the time, the words painted a rich illustration of the many biblical prophecies fulfilled by Christ's birth. So the story of O Come, O Come, Emmanuel is really a condensed study of the Bible's view of the Messiah, who he was, what he represented, and why he had come to earth. Even to this day, if one is a proficient Bible student, the song's lyrics reveal the unfolding story of the Messiah. For the people of the Dark Ages, few of whom read or had access to the Bible, the song was one of the few examples of the full story of how the New and Old Testament views of the Messiah came together in the birth and life of Jesus. Because it brought the story of Christ the Savior to life during hundreds of years of ignorance and darkness, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel ranks as one of the most important songs in the history of the Christian faith. The song owes its worldwide acceptance to a man named John Mason Neal. Born on January 24, 1818, this Anglican priest was educated at Trinity College in Cambridge. Brilliant, a man who could write and speak more than 20 languages, he should have been destined for greatness. Yet many feared his intelligence and insight. At the time, church leaders thought he was too evangelical, too progressive, and too much a free thinker to be allowed to influence the masses. So, rather than getting a pastorate in London, Neil was sent by the church to the Madeira Islands off the northwest coast of Africa. Pushed out of the spotlight and given the position of warden in an all but forgotten locale, it was expected that he and his ideas would never again find root in England. Yet Neil refused to give up on God or on his own calling. On a salary of just 27 pounds a year, he established the Sisterhood of St. Margaret. From this order, he began an orphanage, a school for girls, and a house of refuge for prostitutes. And these noble ministries were just the beginning. When he wasn't ministering to those who could truly be called the least of these, the often frail and sickly Neil reviewed every facet of scripture and scripture-based writings that he could find. It was during these studies that he came across the Latin chant, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. Seizing on the importance of the song's inspired text, Neil translated the words into English. Interestingly, in his initial work, the lyrics began, Draw nigh, draw nigh, Emmanuel. 
The tune that went with Neil's translation had been used for some years in Latin text versions of the song. Vinae Emmanuel was a 15th century processional that originated in a community of French Franciscan nuns living in Lisbon, Portugal. Neil's translation of the lyrics, coupled with Vinae Emmanuel, was first published in the 1850s in England. Within 25 years, Neil's work, later cut to five verses and called O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, grew in popularity throughout Europe and America. Although sung countless times each Christmas, much of the song's rich meaning seems to have been set aside or lost. While both men, the ancient monk and the exiled priest, would probably be amazed that any still remember their work, the fact that few realize the full impact of the words would no doubt disappoint them greatly. After all, to sing a song and not recognize the power and majesty of its meaning trivializes both the music and the lyrics. The first verse of the song is taken from Isaiah 7.14 and Matthew 1.23. It introduces Emmanuel, God with us, and Israel as a symbol for the Christian world held captive on a dark and sinful earth. Isaiah 11 serves as the theme for the verse that begins, O come thou rod of Jesse free. In some translations, this is called the branch of Jesse. In it, the rod of Jesse represents Christ, who is the only one who can defeat Satan and bring eternal life to all those who follow him. O come, O day spring, come and cheer, presents the image of the morning star, a concept that can be traced back to Malachi 4.2. In this verse, the song states that the coming Savior will bring justice, honesty, and truth. He will enlighten and cast out darkness. As Malachi promises, the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its wings. The lyrics then turn to, O come thou key of David, a reference to Isaiah 22, 22. The words in this verse explain that the newborn king holds the key to the heavenly kingdom, and there is no way to get into the kingdom but through him. The verse that begins, O come, O come, Adonai, in some texts this reads, O come thou wisdom from on high, centers on the source of true wisdom. This comes only from God through his Son. Through the Savior, this wisdom can reach around the world and bring peace and the knowledge of salvation to all men. Thus, Christ's teachings and examples fulfilled all Old Testament prophecies. Even today, when sung in a public hall by a small group of carolers, carolers or during a television special, the original chants of long-forgotten monks can almost be heard. Although translated into scores of languages and sung in a wild variety of styles and arrangements, the simplistic yet spiritual nature of the song remains intact. It is reverent, a tribute to not only the birth of God's Son, but also to the fulfillment of God's promise to deliver His children from the world. In this simple but brilliant song, the echoed voices of clerics from the past gently urge today's world to receive and worship the King who fulfills God's greatest promise to His children. So having heard the story behind O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, let's join in singing it. It's number 357 in the LSB hymnal.
The second selection that we'll consider is Angels We Have Heard on High. Many images accompany Christmas. Fun and frolic, snow and decorations, laughter and family gatherings. Images so ingrained in most people's minds that they find it difficult to imagine the holiday any other way. Yet, in truth, Christmas only recently became the festive holiday we now cherish. For almost 1,500 years, the observation of the birth of Jesus was not recognized on every street corner, but left to divinely called men who led a hard and demanding life, toiling in poverty and serving people who understood little about the most elementary facets of Scripture and the life of the soul. Yet these men stayed the course and left their fingerprints on every church of every denomination in the world today. Monks were and still are solitary men, dedicating every ounce of their being to the Lord and giving up their own families to serve the family of God. Their voices were often the only ones who told of the birth of Christ, and their lives the only example of Christian faith. Even to those who knew them, monks were mysterious figures. Their world was one of sacrifice, their sense of duty second only to their humble spirit. Yet from this spirit and life came one of the most beautiful and soaring carols of Christmas. Much like the lives of most monks, Angels We Have Heard on High is a song steeped in great mystery. Unlike other carols whose writers are unknown, but whose origins can be clearly traced to a certain time or certain place, this song seemingly appeared out of thin air. Because the first to sing Angels We Have Heard on High lived in 19th century France, many believe that it must have originated there. In fact, most sources today call it a French carol. Yet even that assumption is often called into question by songologists. What can be stated with absolute certainty is that this Christmas song must have been penned by a person who had a professional knowledge of the Bible and an incredible gift for taking scripture and reshaping it into verse. This fact, combined with the use of Latin in the song's chorus, making it a macaronic carol, seems to indicate that a monk or priest from the Catholic Church was more than likely responsible for writing Angels We Have Heard on High. Because the first published versions of the song used French for the verses, many have naturally assumed that its writer was a priest from France. Yet there is evidence that at least part of this great Christmas hymn was sung before Christianity took deep root in Western Europe. A portion of the carol was used in early Christian church services even before the Roman Empire adopted Christianity as the state religion. Angels We Have Heard on High was first published in 1855 in a French songbook, and I'm not going to try to pronounce the title of that. And records indicate that the song has been used in church, had been used in church masses for more than 50 years before that publication. During those five decades, the lyrics were coupled with the melody that is still used today. Except for the verses translated into languages other than French, today the song is sung just as it was 150 years ago. Yet for maybe a thousand years or more before that, monks probably sang this same song as they celebrated the birth of the Savior. The story well, may well be almost as old as the New Testament church itself. The song's four verses embrace the angel's visit to the lowly shepherds and the shepherd's response. For many biblical scholars, the angels coming to men who worked menial jobs in the fields and informing them of the birth of the Son of God symbolizes that Christ came for all people, rich or poor, humble or powerful. The angel's words in Luke chapter 2, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people, paired with Jesus' own parables concerning shepherds and their flocks, symbolizes that it would be the common man and not kings or religious leaders who would first carry the story of Jesus' life to the masses. But while the shepherd's story of why they came to see the babe in the manger is easily identified in all the stanzas, for many who sing this old song, the chorus is an enigma. Gloria in excelsis Deo means, in English, glory to God in the highest, a phrase that played an important part of worship at church masses dating back to 130 A.D., during that period, Pope Telesphorus issued a decree that on the day of the Lord's birth, all churches should have special evening services. He also ordered that at these masses, after the reading of certain scripture or the conclusion of specific prayers, the congregation should always sing the words, Gloria in excelsis Deo. 
Historical church documents reveal that monks carried this executive order throughout the land and that by the third century it was a practice used by most churches at Christmas services. It can be argued that if the chorus was written within a hundred years of Christ's birth, the roots of angels we have heard on high might go back to someone who actually knew Jesus when he walked on earth. Though unproved, it is certainly a very interesting and inspiring idea. Another facet of this carol that would seem to tie at least its chorus to the very early Catholic Church is the range of notes found in the chorus. While most modern carols move up and down and cover at least an octave and a half, thus testing the upper or lower limits of the average singer, the phrase Gloria in excelsis Deo barely moves at all. In addition, the melody used by the song never strays more than one octave, and the verse moves through only six notes. This simplicity seems to tie the melody to early chants used by monks and taught to their congregations. Webster defines a chant as, quote, singing or speaking in a monotone to a hymn-like repetitive melody, end quote. Using this approach, important elements of worship were passed on from person to person and generation to generation in the oral tradition. In a day when few were able to read words, much less read music, chants helped keep the gospel alive among the common people. Of all the carols born in the chanting tradition, Angels We Have Heard on High was one of the easiest and least challenging, despite the fact that the word Gloria covers three measures and hits almost 20 different notes. Unlike others, which failed to inspire as they taught, this song lifted hearts while telling the story. It embraced the spirit that a called man of God would have felt as he gave up everything to serve his Lord. So why has this carol of unknown origin remained so popular for so long? Though the tune may be considered monotonous, when the simple text is read, it becomes obvious that few Christmas songs so fully describe the joy that the world was given when a Savior was born in Bethlehem. The lyrics don't just ask the singer to lift up his or her eyes and heart in wonder and observe the beauty of what God has given the world. They demand it. There can be no doubt that whoever wrote Angels We Have Heard on High not only believed the words found in the Bible, but relished that belief. Ultimately, it is the sensitive retelling of the angel shepherd story that carries this song and has made it one of the world's most popular Christmas carols. As Kenneth W. Osbeck wrote in his devotional book, Amazing Grace, quote, the Bible teaches that angels are the ministering spirits of God and that they are continually being sent to help and protect us, the heirs of salvation, end quote. Angels We Have Heard on High speaks of the incredible, special relationship between heaven and earth, God and man, like few songs ever have. It embraces one of the most important elements of faith, just as the shepherds embraced the good news that they were given 2,000 years ago. The mystery of who wrote this song points back to the lives of all those who are called to spread the gospel, to keep the story alive to provide a means for people everywhere to hear and know the message fulfilled upon the earth on that first Christmas. One of those nameless servants wrote this song to share the story with others. Although he has long been forgotten, what he believed is alive in not only his song but in millions of souls around the world. His prayer has been answered. The angels are still heard, the Savior still welcomed, and the soul still stirred. So let's join in singing Angels We Have Heard on High. This is number 22 in the Ambassador Hymnal.
final selection is one that I would guess that a number of us would uh, peg as one of our all-time favorites when it comes to musical selections, that being the Hallelujah Chorus drawn from Handel's Messiah. The Hallelujah Chorus is arguably the most powerful piece of music ever written. Though its lyrics are sparse, its meaning is monumental. These powerful words, coupled with one of the most awe-inspiring pieces of music ever penned, put an unmistakably and unabashedly spiritual exclamation point on each Christmas season. This song now reverberates so strongly during the holidays that for many, Christmas does not begin until the Hallelujah Chorus has been performed. It is at that moment when the first Hallelujah is delivered and people rise as one to their feet that the true meaning of Christ's birth is again joyously proclaimed by his people. Yet there is an irony in the belief that it can't be Christmas without Handel's most famed composition. The song itself was never intended for a Christmas audience. It was originally considered to be an Easter offering. And to make this story even more unbelievable, when he composed his most famous work, the great George Handel was a washed-up has-been, a frail, forgotten man living in abject poverty. While penning what is now widely thought of as the world's most dynamic musical salute to the birth of the Savior, Handel essentially was reborn himself. The great composer was born in Halle, Germany, on February 23, 1685. Though a gifted musician, Handel actually flunked out of college. Moving to Hamburg at 18, he began to write operas. He was only modestly successful there, so in 1706 he relocated to Italy. Inspired by the country's history, within three years a re-energized Handel composed two oratorios that were praised by both music critics and the public. Suddenly, George was a local star, the quote-unquote king of the oratorios. Few modern songwriters devote their talents to creating an oratorio, but Handel loved these sacred musicals. Oratorios were essentially dramatic musical presentations of biblical stories written for choruses, but featuring strong soloists in the production's most important segments. Created to provide moral lessons along with classical entertainment, oratorios closely resembled opera without costumes or staging. Inexpensive to produce and easy to understand, the productions were popular with both common people and the elite. Most important to handle, they offered him a chance to succeed while also reflecting his convictions. Handel was a man of deep Christian faith. He prayed often and studied his Bible. He believed that his talent and inspiration came from God. He saw his music as a tribute to his Lord. Even at 25, the composer showed true humility for having realized his goal of providing musical vehicles for the furthering of his faith. In the process of following his calling, Handel had also become the most acclaimed composer in Europe. The top musicians in England sent Handel an invitation to join them, and the composer answered. The composer loved the modern city of London, believed English theater to be the world's best, and felt inspired by the progressive thinking he found in the nation. Yet more than just the environment of what was then the world's greatest city, Handel loved the English language. He felt his prose worked best in the tongue of King James. In his adopted home, the German-born dynamo reached beyond the oratorios that had made him a star and began to compose church and secular music, instrumental pieces, operas, and new arrangements of classical works. His work propelled him to the top of his field, and he was made the director of the Royal Academy of Music. Now the most famous musician in England, he had money, power, and respect. Yet his world was hardly perfect. Behind the scenes, a lingering shadow began to haunt the still young man. It was a demon he could not fight, eventually bringing him to his knees and causing him to question himself, his talents, and his faith. Even as he ruled the entertainment world, Handel physically began to fall apart. Before he reached 40, he suffered several strokes and was all but crippled by rheumatism. By 1741, his eyesight had failed as well. The world which had once been in such sharp focus was now little more than a blur. Legally blind, barely able to walk, Handel also lost his creative powers. Desperate, the depressed composer spent his savings trying to find cures for his various illnesses. He even paid a surgeon for a crude and painful eye operation. Nothing worked. And with no income from writing, directing, or teaching, Handel went from riches to poverty. 
Locked in a tiny home on the wrong side of London, he feared his final stop on this earth would be a debtor's prison. With so many bills due and no way to pay them, the composer dreaded the knock of the mailman. What almost always came were not greetings from old friends, but rather persistent demands from bill collectors. But one warm day in August 1742, the mail brought a double dose of good news. Opening the first envelope, Handel discovered that the Duke of Devonshire wanted the composer to come to Dublin and produce a series of benefit concerts for the relief of the prisoners in the several jails and for the support of Mercer's Hospital on Stephen Street and of the charitable infirmary on the Inns Quay. Anxious to get away from his depressing home, Handel immediately jotted off a note accepting the Duke's offer. While this first letter seemed like an answered prayer, it would be the second that would change not just Handel's life, but the musical world and Christmas itself. Charles Jennings was a wealthy eccentric whom most folks avoided. Those who knew him labeled his behavior as bizarre. He always seemed to have a new idea to do something a bit differently than anyone had ever done it before, and none of those ideas ever panned out. He seemed to think he had the answer for reorganizing local government, for the redistribution of taxes, or for how children should be properly raised to prevent them from falling into a life of crime. If he heard a sermon, he found ways he would have presented it that were more profound and far-reaching. In fact, he even dared to suggest that Shakespeare's work could be improved. So any letter from Jennings would have been dreaded by most who knew him. Few would have even bothered reading the note, but Handel opened the envelope with a rare zeal for a sick man. His enthusiasm was fueled by the memory of some outstanding poems Jennings had sent him some years before. Maybe, the composer thought, the man had done it again. Jennings' letter did not contain any original work, but the unique man had developed an idea for a new oratorio. He had started to write it himself, but had hit a wall. Remembering Handel's earliest hits, Jennings opted to forward the concept to the composer, hoping it might be a source of inspiration. Little did the man know that the great Handel would not only read his letter, but see the potential in its contents. As he explained in the letter, Jennings had taken what he felt were the most important biblical stories centering on the Messiah and cut them down to what he viewed as the bare-bones essential passages of Scripture. His goal had been to create a new musical presentation from his text, but Jennings simply did not have the talent to start the oratorio, much less complete it. Maybe, he thought, old George would be interested. Handel was not only interested, for the first time in years he was inspired. On August 22nd, the composer locked himself in his study and set to work. In seven days, he created the first segment of his new musical. This is now known as the Christmas section of the Messiah. The next part, the redemption story, took nine days. Part three, the resurrection and future reign of Christ on heaven and earth, took another week. After reworking the music several times, Handel felt the new oratorio worthy of a Dublin debut. On April 13, 1742, with just a handful of singers and a small orchestra, the composer brought the work to life in front of a large audience. Though because of his near blindness he could not clearly see the appreciative crowd, he could tell by its response that he had finally composed another hit. Ultimately, the Irish tour was a monumental success for the Duke's charities and the composer's career. At home in England, newspapers were declaring that Handel had made a mighty comeback. A few months later, Handel brought his newest work to the London stage. All of English society was there for the sold-out first few performances. On the second night, King George II was so moved by the first few notes of the Hallelujah Chorus that he rose to his feet. When the audience saw the king standing, they followed suit. The composer had no idea what was happening. He could not see the king or anyone else standing. Yet when the Hallelujah Chorus ended and he heard the thunderous applause, he knew that he had once again achieved his goal of spreading his faith through his music. It would be Handel's annual Eastertide performances to benefit his favorite charity, Foundling Hospital, that would keep him out of debtor's prison and in the public eye for another 17 years. He conducted his most beloved work a final time just eight days before his death in 1759. Even though he had a library of beloved works to choose from, it was the Hallelujah Chorus that played in Westminster Abbey during his funeral. 
This one element of the Messiah was viewed as the great composer's defining moment. Yet with Handel's passing, all of the music from the Messiah began to fade away. Soon it was hardly played at all. Even when Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart reworked Handel's old oratorio, no one seemed to care. A century after Handel's death, the Messiah was a piece reserved for local musicals. There were scores of versions, some of them crude, secular settings of the Hallelujah Chorus, and few were worthy of note. Yet as the Victorian era reshaped English thinking, the British musical establishment rediscovered Handel's once famed work, like its writer had done upon the oratorio's creation, by the 1870s, the Messiah had again emerged from obscurity. It became an Easter favorite of both Protestant and Catholic churches. By 1900, the Messiah was so linked to Easter that people began to expect to hear the oratorio each year. Yet soon a group would move the Messiah to Christmas. This was not caused by the sudden realization that the Hallelujah Chorus magnified the significance of the celebration of the birth of Christ. Rather, it was because Christmas had grown into a holiday that stretched for a month. As people felt more charitable during the holiday season, and as performances of Handel's Messiah always sold out during the other important Christmas Christian holiday, choir directors decided to stage the oratorio in December as a way to raise money for needed charities. Though he had never intended it to light up the season of Christ's birth, suddenly the master composer's fabled Hallelujah Chorus was the musical centerpiece of the Christmas season. Charles Burney, the 18th century music historian, remarked that Handel's Messiah, quote, fed the hungry, clothed the naked, and fostered the orphan, end quote. As a presentation that has raised and continues to raise millions of dollars for charity, it has done all that and more but it has also accomplished more than being used as a Yule season moneymaker. It has dramatically raised the spiritual awareness of countless millions as well. For millions, the Hallelujah Chorus is the most powerful way of remembering the reason for the season. Webster defines Hallelujah as a shout or song of praise or thanksgiving. Handel would have certainly agreed. He explained to his friends that when he contemplated each act, quote, I did think I did see all heaven before me and the great God himself, end quote. It would have taken that kind of inspiration to create a work that is so powerful that one song, Hallelujah Chorus, still brings people to their feet and leads people to the Lord. This wonderful song was more than just a second chance for Handel. It has become perhaps the most powerful musical reminder of the kingdom of salvation that Jesus has established for us all. Well, the Hallelujah Chorus is not found in either one of our hymnals, so you can't open it up and sing it, and it would be a challenge to do that anyhow if you're familiar with this piece of music. So we're going to play it over the sound system, invite you to listen, and if you're familiar, feel free to sing along.
Hallelujah. You may be seated.